Welcome to Just Not Cricket, a football podcast. My name is Hal Stewart and you are... I felt like we could have done it a bit more festive. Well, we're non-time specific. I mean... Oh, we're time specific. People were you saying have to me, made this time specific. No, you've specific. made it time specific. When you're talking about Chesterfield you and their the current run. You said the actual year we were in yet last time. <laughs> well, let's mix it up. Oh, OK. Jose Mourinho, he's just won the Champions League with Inter Milan. I can see him going on to nothing but glory in Serie A for the next 15 years. We're going to be mentioning, I think, Christmas at some point, because I've got a Christmas fact later. OK, fine, you're going to do that. Have I you bought me any? You. you got me anything for Christmas? Good Lord, no. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what I've got, a new handle on Twitter, at JNCPod. We finally made this official. We're sticking around, kids, at JNCPod, because at Just Not Cricket was already taken by a woman who probably hasn't tweeted since 2008, by the looks of it. Now we always kick off with this. The mysterious player... Well, dear listener, viewer, and indeed reader, if you do not know, this is the mysterious player of mystery, where one of us lists the illustrious clubs of a particular player, and the other must guess that player from those clubs. If you get it right, straight off the bat, you get three points. But you are allowed a clue. We are allowed to ask for the field to be narrowed somewhat by asking for the position that player played in. And if you get it right, based on that, you get one point. If you don't get it at all, what do you get, How Nil pas. Nil pas. And I think this is round five of this new particular format. We both had two goes apiece. And at the moment, it's a bit of an upset on. Because <laughs> you are quite good at this game. But you find yourself trailing by four points to one. Because you got three points last time. Fernando around. Morientes. You're setting it for me. I've got a chance to retrieve it and level up. And these are your clubs. Ajax. FC Twenty. Ajax again. Barcelona. Glasgow Rangers. Al Ryan of Qatar. And Al Shamal, also of Qatar. That's a very tricky one. Thank you, Adam, for once again making that far too difficult. I feel like you'll get this one. A very good friend of ours, a mutual acquaintance, a lovely young lady who is a friend of the show. Oh, yes. Made a request a few weeks ago. She is a big fan of your Barry Conlon musical stylings. No idea how happy that makes me. There had to be one out there. (laughs) And she requested... In the spirit of the season that for some reason you're denying exists because we're, quote, timeless, unquote. Timeless. She requested a Barry Conlon Christmas special. All right, here we go. It's Barry Conlon at Christmas. 14 times sold. It's Barry Conlon at Christmas. He's always looked old. He's looked old, so old. James Nesbitt, but bald this Christmas. Wow, that was beautiful, wasn't it? What do you think? That, I have to say, is probably, of the Barry Conlon classics that you have <laughs> kindly supplied us with, that is up there. Oh, thank you. That is a pro- easily top three. Are you just saying that because it's Christmas? Yeah. All right. I am filled with Christmas cheer. Uh, now, I've come up with new rules I'd like to see introduced into the beautiful game, Adam, to spice things up. You know, spice, like Christmas spice. What happened to your time? You criticised me for mentioning Christmas at the beginning of this podcast. I'm just bringing And you it. haven't sharp about it since. So it's Christmas spice. It's uh, so a spice things Jeez. up. Jeez. Well, you know, after the whole vile... Jesus. He's linked with Christmas. <laughs> Is he? The baby Jesus. Oh, the ba- oh that Jesus. Now, Not Gabriel Jesus. Uh, that's what I was thinking Gabriel of. Jesus. Right. Now, you know the whole VAR love affair that's been going on? Do you know, if you had Papa Booba Diop, mm. the father, you could have Son at Tottenham, the mm. son, and mm. then you've also got Nuno Espirito Santo, the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'm just doing a religious thing, it just popped into my head. <laughs> New rules you'd like to see introduced into the beautiful game to spice things up after the VAR love affair. I don't affair. get to say much in these things, so I thought I would just chime in. 
New rules we'd like to see introduced into the beautiful game to spice things up after the VAR love affair has been and gone. That was such a short sentence. It took me ages to get that out. Do you feel like the VAR love affair has been and gone? Well, we never know when people are listening to this. This could be 2023. I mean... Merry Christmas. Oh, yes. Merry Christmas in the year 2023. Now and you're getting the hang Enjoy of it. your digital presence. Or maybe digital food. They'll probably all be in a pill. Digital sprouts. Ooh, they've been on the boil since my grandma got up this morning. Now, how's about this for the new rules, Adam? A net... In the middle of a pit, not Annette, a woman. Oh, right. A net in the middle of the pitch that rises up and down at random intervals. Why? Well, they'd trip over it, wouldn't they? Adds an element of oh, real like a danger. Tennis net. Yes, like a tennis net in the middle. Three goalkeepers. Okay, three goalkeepers. But one half for one team, then the other side has them for the second half. You can deploy them anywhere. Uh, they don't have to be in goal? No. They could, be, could they be sort of fourth officiating? They could be. Running the line? It's your team. Refereeing? Three goalkeepers. Okay. Next element I'm going to throw in, fire. Next one? Uh-huh. Hyenas. Hyenas. Yeah, maybe they're on fire. I feel like that is your answer to most things. Yeah, it is. And then my last one, I hope you like this one. Every time you get a corner, you move the placement of the corner kick forward one yard. So you could end up sort of in the box? Right next to the goal if you get enough corners. Do you still have to take it on the line? Yeah. It's not going to be easier, necessarily, but I think it would throw some real cat amongst the pigeons. Do you get to choose, because obviously the corner flag is sort of, you know, right on the, as you would expect, on the corner. Mm. Do you get to choose which line you go across? Can you go towards the goal? Can you go along? Got to stay along the... Got to stay along the goal line. By line. Okay. Mm. Got any rules you'd like to introduce? No. Adam, what's the first football match you remember going to or watching on telly? I think the first one that I really noticed, really paid attention to, my father was a big Sunderland fan. And uh, you must forgive me because off the top of my head, I can't remember the exact season. It was late 90s, I think. And it was a particularly memorable game. Sunderland were in the uh, second tier, as was uh, the, probably the first division at that time, and reached the playoffs. And I saw the playoff final, watched on the telly, the playoff final against Charlton oh, Athletic. What a game. Probably the game that made me notice that this, this game that I hadn't really paid much attention to before could be pretty exciting. I remember watching that on the telly and there was a, a woman sat down on a seat at Wembley who was in charge of looking at the crowd, not the game. Yes. As a steward. What was the score, like 4-3? I believe it was 4-4 four, four after extra time and it yeah. went to penalties. I remember right at the end when really it was you know Mickey Gray hurling the throw-ins in, everyone going forward. She was sat there reading a book. Well, you know, <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's for the everyone. It's most exciting game. It's if not for everyone. If you didn't like football, you understood how exciting that game was. Of course, it went to penalties as well. And Sasa Illich, I believe, the Charlton goalkeeper, made his name. Sasa Illich in goal. And was it Lionel Perez in goal? For Lionel Perez in goal for, uh, for Sunderland. Clyde Mendonca was obviously the star of the show for Charlton. I think he got a nasty injury in their Premier League season. Never really mm. fully found his best after that. He was great at every club except Sheffield United. Oh, Clyde really? Mendonca scored goals at Green Grimsby as well, yeah. Uh, Kevin Phillips, of course, and Niall Quinn, that deadly strike force mm. for Sunderland. One of my big sporting irks is that Kevin Phillips was so underused at international level. Just because he did not play for a glamorous club. He was the top scorer one season in all of Europe. Not just the Premier League, the whole of Europe. And literally right up into his late 30s, he was still banging goals in whatever club he played for. Criminal. Whoever was England coach at, during those glory years, hang your collective heads in shame. We're back again to Wikipedia Club. Adam, it's your turn. Wikipedia Club. Isn't it always my turn? Well, we, we've done it with me. If you know, people only listen maybe to the first seven, they've suddenly jumped into this point. And oh, I see. They'll think what's going on. What exotic place is he taking us to today? It's Cairo. No way. It is. Egypt. Cairo, Egypt, and Zemelec SC, or the White Knights. Zemelec Sporting Club, based in the city of Giza. They compete in the... Is it uh, old? Uh, see, I even left a little gap here to pause for your <laughs> Have you written? stupid comment. <laughs> they compete in the Egyptian Premier League. They were founded in January 1911 by a Belgian lawyer called George Marsbach as Kazer Al Nil. That was the name of the club. <laughs> Not a great, is it, calling your club Nil? <laughs> Zemelec have a fierce rivalry with Al Ali, who are based on the Cairo side of the River Nile. Giza, the city of Giza, is on the other side of the River Nile. Al so, Ali, uh, former club of one of this podcast's favoured sons, Ahmed Fati. Indeed. And this rivalry, I mean, we've talked about footballing rivalries before, but this rivalry is considered to be one of the most violent derbies 
in world football. It's a rivalry that dates back to the days of the British rule in Egypt. Al Ali, again, we've talked about the difference between clubs and their sort of social status and how that has shaped rivalries. Al Ali was the club of the people. Zemelec was the club of the bourgeois elite oh. and the foreigners. I think that's probably why I went for them and not... Because you look down with scorn. I feel my. I feel like in those days I would have been a member of the bourgeois elite. You drive past houses in places like Darlington and say, uh, these of course are not where people live, it's for their pets. I have never been to Darlington. No, but if you did, it's a fictitious scenario. Oh, I see, I see. So entrenched was Zemelec's place with the elite that from 1941 it was named King Farouk Club <laughs> after the nation's deeply unpopular ruler. Yeah, he was. And that name was dropped following the 1952 revolution and the club was rechristened Zemelec. Does Zemelec mean anything? There is a district of Cairo not too far away, very actually very affluent district of Cairo, based on the island of Gezira, which sits on the Nile. Zemelec Sports Club is just to the west of that district. Although, interestingly enough, Al Ali, the big rivals, their stadium is on that very same island. Oh. So they're actually slightly closer geographically to the district of Zemelec than Zemelec are. Can I guess what Zemelec actually translates to? Uh, well, you can, but I haven't got a clue if you'd be right. Well, so let's just, just let's fill just your make boots. It up. Let's make it up. All right, it's, it uh, translates to uh, marmalade trampoline. The club play in white kits with two red horizontal stripes and should play their home games at the Helmi Zamora Stadium. But Named that stadium Bobby Zamora. has been, indeed, <laughs> that stadium has been deemed not fit for purpose. A bit like Bobby Zamora. So they play their games at the Petrosport Stadium in Cairo with a capacity of... 60,000. 16. That's what I meant. Or they play at the Cairo International Stadium with a capacity of... 60,000. 75,000. Mm, well. That is its capacity in the all-seating days that we currently live in, or do we in this time as world? <laughs> Before seating, it was not uncommon for big derby games between Zemelec and Al Ali to have crowds of over 100,000 people. Zemelec have a long and storied history and are one of Egypt's most successful clubs. Their list of honours includes 12 Premier League titles, 26 Cups, 3 Egyptian Super Cups, 2 Sultan Hussein Cups, 2 Afro-Asian Cups, 1 Arab Club Championship, 2 Saudi Egyptian Super Cups, and that is a hard competition to win, I think we all know, 5 African Champions Leagues, an African Cup Winners' Cup, and 3 African Super Cups. They were at one point neck and neck without Ali with their continental record. Each had won five Champions Leagues, but the red half of the city have since claimed three more. They have eight Champions Leagues at Ali. Uh, despite their success, Zemelec have remained in the shadows of their bitter rivals, which may explain the number of coaches they've gone through since club president Mortada Mansour took the reins in 20. 14. Would you like to have a guess? Since 2014, to this timeless moment now, how many coaches have been in the dugout? I'll go with eight. Christian Gross of Tottenham is their current coach. He is the 20th appointment in that time. Did he get the tube there? Oh, that's an old reference. Uh, past coaches include uh, Mido, once of Tottenham Hotspur. Hossam Hassan, who is one of uh, Egypt, I think Egypt's most capped player. He may even be actually the most capped international player in world football, Hossam Hassan. Mm. Jaime Pacheco and Josuado Ferreira, Portuguese coach, and Marcos Paqueta, the Brazilian former national coach of Saudi Arabia, and of course, Alex McLeish. Of course. Do you not remember his 10-game really. spell? Doesn't leap to the forefront his of His 10-game spell in early 2016? No. He had a good record, actually, here, and he lost two of those 10. Won <laughs> six, drew two. That's pretty good. But out he went. Current star of the show is Congolese striker Kabongo Kasongo. And former players include, as I mentioned, he was a former coach, Mido played for them. As did Amir Zaki. Remember him? His Premier League season with Hull Wigan. as well he played for? He played for Wigan. He, he scored lots of goals for Wigan. He, Steve Bruce took him to Hull mm. when Steve Bruce made, well, didn't quite work out for no. him. Has, Hassam Iman, who was the first Egyptian to play in Serie A. Can you name the club? Perugia. Unesi. Oh, Hassan Shahata, he played for them. He is most more famous as a coach. He led Egypt to three successive African Cup of Nations titles. Former Arsenal goalkeeper Rami Shaban was one, a former player. He, interesting fact about Rami Shaban, was going to be a mysterious player of mystery, but I thought it was too hard. Yeah, darn right. <laughs> so I scrapped him. Thanks. Most famous of all, and I know a player you're very fond of, Junior Agogo. The Ghanaian. The Ghanaian. What do you mean, the Ghanaian? Oh, I'm not going to mention some of his clubs. Uh, Sheffield Wednesday. No, I wasn't going to say for. that. And yes, yeah, a Ghana international. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that is those are the White Knights of Zemelec Sporting Club. 
We have another guest on the podcast. Boing, boing, baggies time. Paul Chappell, a West Bromwich Albion, or as we say on Just Not Cricket, West Bromwich Halbion fan. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on, uh, guys. Good to be here. Paul, what we want to get from you is a little bit as well, much as we possibly can about West Bromwich Albion. So let's start with your first ever game, my friend. It was Stoke City at home. We beat them 6-0. Don Goodman got a hat-trick. I never saw Don Goodman play for the club again. He got injured a couple of weeks later and then we sold him to Sunderland. And it took about 25, 20 to 25 years for us to see us beat Stoke again. So uh, <laughs> thanks, Dad, for that. Obviously, uh, building up my dreams as if this is what happens week in, week out. They but really yeah. did set the expectations high with that one, didn't they? It really did. 6 yeah. nil. Were you the same age as the amount of goals? Yeah, I was around there. Yeah, I was around five, five six years old. I, can't, I think I've only ever seen us score that amount of goals about four or five times. Time. So, for a first game, it was a, it was certainly a good one. West Bromwich Albion have had memorable seasons. Certainly, in my time of following football, and we're the same age, Paul. So we've probably seen the exact same amount of the seasons I'm talking about. If there was one, I had to say to you, just pick your favourite season following the Baggies. Does one leap to mind? Yeah, obviously the the big one for most Albion fans is for us. We in terms of success, obviously we've had seasons where we've survived. Um, by the skin of our teeth and things like that, which is always a great feeling. But in terms of success for us would be 2001, 2002. From a personal point of view, we uh, we overhauled our great rivals, Wolverhampton Wanderers. We caught them up. They, or they blew a lead, whichever way you want to see it. It was written in the stars and there's various things that happened that season that uh, went our way. And also, of course, more importantly, obviously, as a, as a big fan of this podcast, it was also the season and the year that the world's greatest football game was released. Um, oh, yeah. So, Championship Manager 0102 is what Paul's exactly, referring to. Exactly. So as seasons and as years go, that, that I think I pretty much peaked there. So, <laughs> OK, I've got another one for you. Now, you okay. mentioned Don Goodman. He did go to Sunderland, you're absolutely right, but he also played for Wolves, your arch rivals, Wolverhampton Wanderers. How do you feel about players that, first of all, leave the baggies and go to Wolves, but also, I don't know how many there's been, but players that have joined from Wolves or have had a Wolves past at some point in their career? From a personal point of view, being, being brutally honest, guys, I don't really get too hung up on players leaving. I, I, I appreciate that it's a short career and so on and so forth. When we have players joining us from uh, when we have players joining us from our rivals, it's fantastic, and I love rubbing it in. Uh, I remember Keith Andrews obviously scoring in a in a five one win away at Molyneux. I got a quick question for you about Keith Andrews. Is he wearing a piece? Because well, it, it looks like a syrup, doesn't it? It's it's fantastic. I mean, it's it's absolutely it's 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 absolutely fantastic. I think it's what we all aspire to. <laughs> and if, if I if I can look like. Keith Andrews, which I don't. If I could, if I could have hair like Keith Andrews, then yeah. uh, I'd certainly be a happy. It's man. like Lego hair. You can just take it off and change yeah. it for other hair. I never thought I'd hear somebody say that Keith Andrews is the look we all aspire to. <laughs> never in my life. It's amazing what you hear on this podcast. <laughs> the beautiful game always surprises. Of the players you have seen with your own two eyes, what is your finest baggies eleven? OK, it's a little bit difficult because obviously the great teams are West Brom and obviously I did stick to the rules of players I've seen, got rid of players that we've had on loan because obviously we've had people like Lukaku on loan and, and uh, David Speedy and people like that. You know, fantastic strikers. <laughs> the problem that we've got is pretty much we, our best team is from the last five years. And I know that we had a, a horrendous season last year, but on paper, last year's squad was the strongest that we've ever had. So... In terms of uh, quality of players, if I did that, it would just simply be our squad from either last year or the year before. Paul, if you don't um, have Richard Sneakers in this team, you can get out. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing, but Enzo Maresca. Oh, nice shout. Well, that is that is the one. I mean, you've, one, one of you's right. One of you's right. One of you's picked a player. So I've gone for uh, I've gone for Ben Foster. Quite quite simply, the. The, the, the greatest keeper I've ever seen play for West Bromwich Albion. Absolutely phenomenal. We, we've had a lot of half-decent keepers, actually, over, over the years. Russell uh, who, Holt? Who, of course, Paul, you told Russell. me a story off air about Russell Holt, which we can't share for libel reasons, but it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll get in trouble for that. But we yeah, all yeah, will. It's a very good story. Adam, I'll Ooh, tell you later. <laughs> I look forward to it. Also, as well, interesting fact about Ben Foster, he is good enough and could have been a chef, a top, uh, yeah, basically a chef. He's good enough as a cook. Wow. 
that he qualified as a chef. Good to have something to fall back on if it doesn't yes, work yeah, out for him. Yeah, in his yeah. case, an oven. Right back, I would pick a player called Igor Ballis. Now, Igor Ballis, interesting, uh, was was our right back in the 0102 season, the one the season I was on about. But, I mean, Igor's a club legend, and the reason is that season we missed seven out of eleven penalties, and then penultimate game of the season, we're away at Bradford. And 90 minutes has gone and we get awarded a penalty. It's nil-nil. Up steps, Igor Ballis converts it, absolutely smashes it bottom corner. We win one nil, leapfrog the walls and, and obviously with one game to go. And it comes out afterwards that because of his poor English, he'd been unable to communicate with people at the club, but he'd actually been the penalty taker for every club he's ever been at. So we went through, I think, six penalty takers that season, missing seven out of 11. And at right back, we had a a, a, a very, very I apt love penalty taker. A right back that takes penalties. The other thing about Eagle, which everyone loved, he used to stop at a hotel called the Moat House in West Bromwich and didn't have a car and basically just used to walk to the ground and back from the ground every <laughs> every match day with his with his boots in a bag. Love it. Yeah, my two centre halves, Gareth McCauley, didn't enter the professional game until he was twenty four, signed for West Brom from Ipswich on a free transfer at thirty one. I remember sitting in the pub watching him score an own goal for Northern Ireland with a Wolves fan who, and they'd just spent £6 million on Roger Johnson and me, bad mouthing and about Albion always uh, taking the cheap option. And then this guy basically gave us six six years and, and 200 peer appearances and was absolutely fantastic. And he's still going strong up at, at uh, yeah, and he left us in the summer and he's now still going strong up at Rangers. And it's incredible. It's, it's even the name of my uh, even my FIFA team. He's called G McLover. So uh, I thought you were going to say your is, son is... or something. <laughs> <laughs> my youngest um, G uh, McLover. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Alongside, um, yeah, alongside McCauley, uh, Johnny Evans, best defender by far, probably the best in terms of technical ability and everything like that I've ever seen at the Alvin. He's, he's just a class above. Left back would be Kieran Gibbs, probably. Um, we haven't had too many really great left Neil backs Clement. in terms of just. I did love Clement. Good story that that I was very fortunate that I was in the sponsors' lounge when we drew one all at home to Southampton, and Chris Brunt scored, and and we got promoted. We got back promoted back up to the Premiership, and Clement got man of the match. And usually, it's within about 20, 25 minutes. The man of the match is up there. He's in a suit, and Clement turned up basically in just his shorts holding a bottle of champagne and just basically said, can we get this over with? Because everyone's having a party down in the dressing room. So, yeah, he was, he was certainly a popular lad that day with, uh, with the opposite sex. <laughs> but, yeah, I would, I would probably go, as a, as a natural left-back, I would, I would go Kieran Gibbs, who, who, who is premiership class. I mean, he's been fantastic this season. Three goals from left-back, which I think is, equals his best ever stats. He's doing really well. Midfield, right-hand side, well, probably three centre midfielders and a winger kind of thing, but go for Zoltan Gera. Did everything that we wanted to do, and it was a, it was a fairly unknown. And he, he should have actually signed for Tottenham the year before he signed for West Brom, but his club pulled out the deal, and then David Pleat left Tottenham, and then and then basically was doing a little bit of advisory work for West Brom, and and said to Gary Megson, "You got to sign this bloke." And so Megson just went and bought him on Pleat, David Pleat's uh, advice, and obviously had two spells at the club. Can we have no more mentions of Gary Megson? Because I will be sick in my mouth if that's all right. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with Mega. There's a lot He's wrong. He's good at what he does. And good I have, at what he does, I have so. no time for the man. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can no say. No problem. Uh, left hand side, I'd have Chris Brunt. 350 appearances, club captain. Absolute legend. Doesn't get the plaudits he, he should. One, one of a, the typical one of a left foot. The two in the middle, Jason Kumas, would, would be one of my centre midfielders. Technically wise, just the best player I've, I've, I've ever seen play for West Bromwich Albion. Just uh, the biggest compliment I can give him is that he's as close to Gascoigne as I've ever seen. He just glided past people. He actually turned us down. Uh, I was talking to the press officer at West Brom about him and uh, asking him a few stories about a few of the players I'd picked. And he said, uh, he said, Kumas actually turned us down for six months, refused to come because he didn't drive and he didn't want to move from Merseyside. And uh, eventually West Brom had to pay for him to come down and, and pay every until he'd settled himself down in the Midlands. But he, he never really liked football. And, and really? As he's, yeah, he, he, was, he was never a great fan of football. He's, he's completely fell off the map now. I mean, there was mm. a... There's a piece in the in in the Welsh news about only about four weeks ago about finding out who he, where he was and everything and he's he's a bit like David Batty he's a nomad he just can't find the guy and he was so fantastic and yeah obviously it's, it's fairly well known that when he was at uh, Liverpool's academy they uh, 
Liverpool's academy, he, he was picked as the number one spot above, um, and number two was Steven Gerrard. Wow. So he was actually rated above Steven Gerrard when he was at Liverpool's academy, but should have gone on to much, much bigger things than he did. But what we, what he did do was brilliant. My other sentiment Here we go. would be Enzo Maresca. Oh, wow. Of course it is. <laughs> My, uh, my my favourite ever West Brom player. Wow. Uh, arrived, yeah, by, by a long way, simply because he arrived on a free from Cagliari. 47 appearances later, we sold him to Juventus for 4.3 million, which remember this is this is nearly 20 years ago. So it's a lot of money. And he's, he's had a fantastic career around Europe, but he was just that good that we bought a player called Mario Bortolazzi as has been like Italy's number two and everything like that, just to babysit him, just so we wouldn't get, just so we wouldn't get homesick. Oh, nice! Once in a lifetime players that you pick up and you just think are, are phenomenal. My two strikers, the best striker I've seen at the Albion would be Kevin Phillips, and he was getting on with his career. So I'd, I'd have loved to have seen him when he was like mid to late twenties when he was banging goals in at Sunderland because he was he was fantastic for us and got better and better, and loved the goal against the Wolves. Loved the long ranger against the Wolves and, and scored, I think, the one season when we played him five times. I think he got six goals in the five games. So he's a living legend. And then, of course, the biggest goal scorer I've seen at the Albion is, is, is a certain Mr. Bob Taylor, who scored loads of goals. And the, the biggest compliment I can give, give Bob Taylor is that I watched him in teams that were losing to second division and non-league teams in the Cups. And he, he always got a goal, but the rest of the players around him were absolutely dire. <laughs> And then he also scored the goal that got us up, basically. We beat Crystal Palace last game of the season, 0 one 2 2 Darren Moore scored the first, and Bob Taylor got the second. So so basically, him and Big Dave um, yeah. Yeah, scored the goals that took us up. So just an out-and-out pure goal scorer. I would guarantee you 15, 20 goals a season. Um, yeah, it's, it's every, everything as a young lad growing up. He was everything I wanted to be, this regular goal scorer. Some good choices there, Paul. I wouldn't have guessed all of those. Few, few, few unusual ones in there. Absolutely, but, uh, that's what we want from our favourite elevens. I mean, there was no Fabian De Freitas. That yeah. was a little bit of a, <laughs> little bit of what a disappointment. What a debut, though, for mm. Fabian De Freitas. Talk about good debuts. Scored two on his debut, I think, at home to Norwich. And then uh, I think we had Crew next game. And um, he thought <laughs> he thought it was an evening kickoff, so he did get the <laughs> did get, And it was a three. I'm sure it was like a bank holiday Monday or something like that. Oh, Adam, I'm glad you brought that up. We've all played that card before. <laughs> now. I didn't know we were starting to <laughs> late. Paul Chappell, West Bromwich Albion fan, thank you very much for joining us on Just Not Cricket, a football podcast, for sharing your favourite 11 and more importantly, for not mentioning the Battle of Bramall Lane. <laughs> Quick quiz. I say the name of a player and you tell me which nation, Adam, they represented at full international level. I feel like I'm going to be good at this. Muzzy, is it? Turkey. Jeremy. Jeremy Aliadier. Just Jeremy. Cameroon. Ulysses de la Cruz. Uh, Ulysses de la Cruz played for Ecuador. And since 2013 has been a member of the country's National Assembly for the governing... Pice Alliance, that's the Ecuadorian centre-left social democratic political party. There is a fact about Ulysses de la Cruz, apart from the one you've just said. He is from a town, a small town in Ecuador that supplied about eight or nine members of Ecuador's World Cup team. Very high up as well, above sea level. Higher than, I believe, West Bromwich Albion Stadium. Now you're just... Which is the highest above sea level in Britain. You're just talking nonsense now. Nothing is higher than West Brom Stadium. The Hawthorns, we do know the name of it. Aki Rihalati. Yeah, that is the Hawthorne, isn't it? Mm. Yes, that's what it's called. That's what it's called. Aki Rialanti played for Finland. He's doing really well. Adele Tarapt. I Though I think he came through the French youth system, I think his international colours have been nailed to the mast of Morocco. Radi Jaidi. Radi Jaidi played for Southampton, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, Birmingham and, and Bolton. And Tunisia. Yes, 105 caps. Right, we're getting it a little bit more difficult now. Not too tough so far. Uh, I'm thanking Lee, by the way, from CM Network for setting these questions. Papi Cisse. Papi Cisse is a Senegalese international. All right, last one. For every single one correct, Abu Diaby. Abu Diaby. Who did he represent at international Abu level? Diaby. Abu Diaby. I can't actually immediately play Abu Diaby. Played for Arsenal. Was always injured. I think he's one of those many players that came through the French system but was eligible for an African nation. But I think he played for France. <laughs> He's got them all! France, 16 caps, one goal. Adam, you got every single one correct. You weren't swayed as I tried to sway you with uh, 
Abu Dhabi. Well done. Obviously keep this timeless, but on October the 7th, 2018, Gurav Maki became the youngest goalscorer in the history of the Indian League at the age of just 16 years old. Two months later, the player was suspended for six months for lying about his age. He's 28. <laughs> no way. How does he pass for 16 at the age of 28? The man's got a full moustache. <laughs> <laughs> Fakes, 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 fakes. This week's Chuffing's Hapney. I actually left. Pause for Adam's tittle and mirth. Nothing forthcoming. Oh, I didn't have that in my script. Chuffing's Hapney. Ha! <laughs> ha! Oh! Can you say something does, like, how do you do it, Hal? What does mirth sound like? A bit, it's like a festive laugh. Oh, okay. Do you want to try it again? Ho, ho, ho! Born in London, 1886, his father was a famous pig iron merchant, his mother a professional wrestler. Is that how you keep your pigs smooth? It really is. Chuffings was expelled from four schools by the age of ten, became a town crier at eleven, then performed the role of a human alarm clock for the village of Swindley until he was nineteen. After that, he was signed by Manchester United. He remained with the club for seven seasons as a tough blood and thunder all-action physio. He lost his job after treating winger Glenn Glenson for a broken leg with trepanation. Now that is the thing where you bore into the skull, isn't it? And it was the wrong diagnosis. Let the yeah. gases out of the brain. Absolutely. Give me some stats and stuff. I've got some stats for you. Give me some stats. I've got some, well, actually, more, it's more stuff than stats. Give me some stuff, then. Because, you know, people people get in touch and say that they quite like the, the facts and the stats because they can kind of play the game with their... I believe they use the word lads. Yeah, lads, yeah. With the lads. Yeah. They gather the lads round and Have they... Have you got any lads? No. Mm. You've got a harem, haven't you? N- no. Oh. What have you got? Nothing, really. No, just, just you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got you a couple of flannels. You talk to them. Here's a question for you. Do you know the largest population centre in England to never have fielded a top-flight football team? Where is that? It's, uh, you're, you're in the right... I'm in the right... Right, right now in the words. Right neck of the words is in Devon, is it? Oh, well, um, oh, oh, you're Cornwall. Actually, no. No, Devon. No, you're De- right, Devon. I was it's right with Devon. Devon. All right. Yeah, OK. What, Plymouth or Argyle? Bang on. With a population of three, nearly 300,000, Plymouth is the largest city in the country to have never been represented in the top flight of English football. It's funny you say that. Last night I was at a house party and... Uh, oh, you were. <laughs> I was talking to... No, uh, yeah, that wasn't happening either. <laughs> you don't go to parties. And if you did go to parties, you wouldn't talk to anyone. I was talking to this lad and uh, he's a Plymouth Argyle fan. OK. And I actually this said to him... Fictional lad. Plymouth ever made it into the Premier League, the catchment area alone would make them one of the best supported clubs in England. The geography must be holding them back. Do you think? Do you think it must be... Well, it's a beautiful it, Surely it must be difficult to attract, particularly foreign players. Down Lovely, to, though. It's not like some places. But it's so far away from the bright lights of our big cities. It's not Makachkala. Well, they don't even play in Makachkala. Well, they, Ma- let me let They me did rephrase. play they in Makachkala. They Mikach- do play in Makachkala. They live in Moscow. Well, maybe if they commute. Plymouth put all their players up in Moscow, things would be different. Okay, Have they well, at least tried it? Could someone suggest it? Do you know the only player to score in the Manchester derby, the Merseyside derby, and the Old Firm derby? It must be Andrei Kanchelskis. It's Andrei Kanchelskis. Do my impression of Andrei Kanchelskis? No. Okay. Oh god. Then. Oh, I thought there was going to be a. I thought there was going to be a, like a sound element to that. It was more visual that one. It was. It worked brilliantly. Looked in this like format. him though, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Can I put it away now? Do you know what connects Jose Mourinho and Pavel Nedved? Is it a love for tapas? Do you know the other thing uh, that connects? They named their children after themselves and their respective wives. Oh, uh, yeah. I Jose's kids are Jose and Matilde. Pavel's kids are Pavel and Ivana. Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Are you familiar with Zlatan yeah, yeah. Ibrahimovic? He's the first man to score for seven different clubs in the Champions League. But he himself has never won the Champions League, despite the fact that six of those clubs are past winners of the Champions League. Can you name the six? Uh, Milan. Milan. Juventus. Juventus. Inter. Inter. Barcelona. Barcelona. Ajax. Ajax. Manchester United. Manchester United. So I can. And the club that didn't? Paris Saint-Germain. Paris Saint-Germain. That's excellent work. Thank you. Well done. I don't think he's going to win it with LA Galaxy. 
Well, I feel like you're making an assumption. You're there. right. It's a sweeping statement. I take it. I back. mean, was it Bastian Schweinsteiger's press conference when he signed for Chicago yes. Fire when one of the journalists legitimately asked him if he thought he could lead Chicago Fire to the World Cup? To be fair, he hasn't been given long enough, I believe, no, to achieve that goal. He needs to have time to lay down the foundations yes. to achieve that, shall we say, quite lofty <laughs> objective. You've got to have ambitions. Chicago would also need to succeed from the union. <laughs> <laughs> you know which, what? With Trump in charge? Historically has not been a good thing. Give it a go. Do you know the only national side to never lose to Brazil? This national side have played them four times and have never lost. Sweden. Oh, you are so close. Norway. Norway. Huh. Have never lost in four outings in Brazil. Highly rated Club Rouge defender Dion Coles is named after Dion Dublin. <laughs> Brilliant. When Joe, I just think this is interesting because mm-hmm. it just shows how much changes in the world of football. When Jose Mourinho was sacked by Manchester United, whenever that was in this timeless sphere we live in, there were still 194 days left on the six-year contract that was offered to David Moyes <laughs> Bring him when back. he replaced Sir Alex Ferguson. Do what they do in Italy. Give him the five months he would have had left. You know, you're still paying him. Just, they could do that. They do, they do it at Palermo all the time. Are they still paying him? Well, I don't know. He's got five months left. Did they the not contract. just give him a love lump sum? A love left? sum? What's a oh, hello? Come into my cupboard. I have a love sum to give you. Uh, who, who was that? It's Vincent Candela. Is he representing David Moyes? Always representing Manchester United in this deal. Both just hangs a, around. He represents both. It's a conflict of interest. Ready for a game? Is it a physical or a mental game? Might end up being both. Okay. What's in the box? Oh, yes, I remember this. Okay, here we go. Can I don't really understand it, but I remember it. Identify the competition from what's in the box? A French phrase book. Uh huh. A hat containing the names of just four nations. Uh huh. A photo of a gobsmacked Fabian Barthez. Mm hmm. Oh. Oh, you want? I think I know. You're going to get it at the third one again. I'm, shall I guess? Should yeah. I just go in now? You haven't even got the fourth one. Shall you I didn't go need the fourth all in one last time? In poker parlance. I'm glad that's the parlance you were on about. I'm going to be so chuffed if this is right. I think it's le tournoi, and I think this is a reference to Roberto Carlos's free kick goal for Brazil against France. Fabian Barthez being in goal that left his boot free kick, left his boot headed towards the corner flag, and with the most ridiculous swerve, found the top corner. Now, questions for you, for the full points. Is it Le Tournoi or La Tournoi? I think, actually, it's La Tournoi. That sounds better. It's Le Tournoi. You were right the first time. Go with your gut. Oh. And what year? I feel like it was just before the 98 World Cup. I don't know if it was just before in the same year or in the, the year. I'm going to go with 98. It was a few <laughs> months before the World Cup in 98. It was, but it was 97. Oh, so close. <laughs> the final clue, a champion's medal for... I don't know. Well, actually, was it won by England? It was won by England. Glenn Hoddle's England. Runners up Brazil, third place France, fourth place Italy. Top scorer at the tournament with three goals was the Italian striker... David Batty. Alessandro Del Piero. Oh, you were okay. so very close. That was... was in the box. Adam. Yeah? Text from the original creators of the beautiful oh, game. Oh, my God. <laughs> Adam, text. I mean, I know I I sometimes jokingly (laughs) disparage some of the things you do, but I do genuinely hate this one. I can't even pretend. Do you want me to scrap it? I just loathe it. I thought it was coming in threes. You had your three. I I didn't air the last one because you said it was unairable. Yeah, but it was. Okay, well, I've cleaned it up a bit. Okay. (laughs) This would be the last one. I feel like you just need to get it out of your system. I feel like I do now, yeah. No one's ever mentioned this. No, I've no idea if people like it or hate it. I mean, I've got a rough idea. People tend to side with you. That's what I'm gathering. Text from the original creators of the beautiful game has recently been discovered. And as you probably know, football was invented in Scotland by the High Society. And I have another extract from a soon-to-be-published memoir of Sir Ebenezer Morley. Right. <laughs> Twas a chilling and dark night. I heard the horse and carriage of Sir Cecil of Gloucestershire arrive before I was alerted to his presence by my manservant. Marcus, the manservant. A weary and shaking Sir Cecil stood before me in the dining hall. I greeted him as warmly as I could muster, as it was now long past his expected arrival time, and supper had been cleared from the table. I offered him a flagon of ale and some bread, but he dismissed these as soon as the words left my quivering mouth. Instead, he simply gestured to the warmth of the drawing room. Sir Cecil opened his hefty satchel and handed me a sealed scroll. His look was stern. 
I hurriedly opened the unspoiled parchment, which I held in my hand. It would change my life and that of the townsfolk and villagers for miles around. I gasped. Sir Cecil turned away, a clenched fist just inches from his tight-lipped mouth, before I could utter a single word. Inbounded young Henry of Hamilton! He ripped the manuscript from my quivering hand and loudly exclaimed... Oh, thanks, Hen. I run out of dish rag for my crusty, pus dripping craters. I've a fiery face, a greasy yellow fungus on my chin. Crack on, chaps. Ken what I mean. Right up ya. I don't like Henry of <laughs> Hamilton. The mysterious player of mystery. Now, you were doing that act thing where you pretend like you don't know. I really haven't got a clue. Just before you nail the right answer. Ajax, FC Twente, Ajax again, Barcelona, Rangers, Al Ryan of Qatar, and Al Shamal also of Qatar. All right, I'm going to go for it. Oh, you're, gonna, you're not going to ask for the... I think I know that he's a midfielder that could play in the centre or the right. Uh-huh, I uh-huh. think it's Ronald De Boer. Oh, see, I knew it was all an act. Oh, yes! I don't know. I've got oh, it. Oh, I haven't got a clue. I've got it, right? Oh, I've got no chance. Of course it's Ronald De For Bull. all. We're for all. You knew it was Ronald De Bull. Do you know who? I, I genuinely didn't get it until just then. Do you know who I was thinking? Who were you thinking? Arthur Newman. Well, why did you go with Ronald De Bull? Because I did... suddenly thought, did Arthur Newman start at a different Dutch club than Ajax? And then I, 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 I doubt it. I don't think he did. I, thought, I think he was not He might have been Ajax. But then it was the, the Qatar time. Yes. Well, I was hoping you would get confused between Ronald and Frank. I don't look like a Ronald Frank confuser. Because Frank played. Didn't he go to Qatar as well? And they both play for Barcelona and Rangers. Yeah, it's like they were brothers. I was being so tactical. I know I my I put diverse. so much thought into it. Sorry to ruin it for you. Oh, uh, you, you did actually really ruin it for me. You played 91 games for Rangers. Do you know what his goal scoring record was? 17. 32. Wow. It's pretty impressive. In fact, in his 492 career games, 122. It's really good. So that's a very good record. He's also scored 13 goals in 67 appearances for the Netherlands. And I do have a fun fact for you. Ronald de Boer featured on the cover of FIFA 96, the video game. <laughs> and do you know who was also on the cover with him? Someone quality. So a real class Oh, act. no, yeah, proper, proper world class. Oh, yeah. Was it Winston Bogard? <laughs> <laughs> Played for Liverpool. English, but for some reason also Irish. Jason McAteer. Jason McAteer. He's busy doing his shampoo adverts at the same time. On the cover of FIFA wow. 96 with Ronald De Boer. It's a big year for McAteer. And actually, if you click on the Wikipedia link for the FIFA 96 game, you are presented with a picture of the cover. And on that cover, I'm not quite sure which territory this was released in, or for which for which uh, game console, but on the cover of that, Andy Legg. <laughs> <laughs> True fact. You can check that back. for yourselves. Had a good long throw on him, ironically. <laughs> that is a that is a good gag. Uh, right, it's time for Adam's history corner. Yes. Is that it? No kind of big build up. Do you want a bigger one? Yeah. And what about a build up? Hey! hey! I felt like I walked into that. <laughs> That's what she said. As I answered, I knew that was what was coming. Yeah, I'm better than that. You're not. I'm really not. My history corner. It's not so much a history corner today. It's more oh, just God, some folklore. Again. Some festive fact. No, it's not folklore. God, I've had enough of the folklore. You liked the folklore. I found a podcast. You right? encouraged it, and that's why there was a couple of them. I found a podcast that just talks about myths and folklore. Oh yeah, that's a bit much. It's got thousands of downloads. Oh well, there you go. Maybe so bring maybe, it back. So maybe I'm getting really mixed signals from you that's, now. That's the way I roll. I have some in the spirit of the season because it is, despite being time, it is Christmas. Can I just interrupt you? I did, <laughs> it's the first time you've asked. I did a poll on Twitter for the best animal, guinea pig or vole. Right. Guinea pig came out on top. Uh, as it should. 64% of the vote. Absolutely. Guinea pig is much better than a vole. Well, that's because you just want to eat the face off. You're know, like Nicolas Cage and John Travolta in that film. Um, Jurassic Park. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's good, because that's not the film you were thinking of, and I think we all know that. Festive facts. If you were Jolly Old Saint Nick... Father Christmas, Chris Kringle, Santa Claus, any of the above. Do you know how many homes a second you would have to visit to deliver presents to all the children that you need to deliver presents to in one night? 17,000. 7,000. 17,000 a second? <laughs> no, you just have to do 822. 822? A second. Yeah, I wasn't going to get that. 
That is travelling at 650 miles a second as well. I'm counting second homes. The Bible... I'm reading it at the moment, so if you could not spoil the end, please. Oh, okay. Because uh, oh. I don't want it to be like one of those where it finishes with like a potential for a sequel. Oh, no, 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 it just ends. Okay, fine. It's very exciting as well. Does it? it? Oh. Okay. It also never mentions the fact that Jesus was born in December. Historians widely believe Jesus was born in the spring. The date of December 25th is believed to have been picked sometime in the 3rd century to coincide with the pagan festival of Saturnalia, which honoured Saturn, the god of agriculture, with drinking, eating and gift-giving. Which I think is the best kind of honouring. Because I like to eat. You do? You like to eat? I'm, I've, I've, I've eaten. You prefer to drink your food. That's the strange thing. I ate yesterday and I enjoyed it so much I might do it again today. You ate yesterday. Mm. You pushed the boat out. I really did. In the USA, Christmas was outlawed from 1659 to 1681. Why? It was considered celebrating a pagan festival. Ah. Which kind of technically it is. Mm. So unimportant was Christmas that after the War of Independence, the new US Congress held their first session... On the 25th of December, 1789. It wouldn't become a national holiday for another 100 years. And in the UK, Christmas was banned by real-life Buzz Killington, Oliver Cromwell, after the Civil War in 1647. There was no Christmas from 1647 to 1660. I must have really hit Coca-Cola's sales. Before the introduction of Turkey in England, the traditional Christmas meal was a pig's head served with mustard. I don't think that would have been as nice. Not as much meat on the face of a pig. No, you know what you need. A guinea pig. Exactly. The wrong kind of pig. You sure you didn't misread it? Jingle Bells was the first song performed from space, when astronauts Tom Stafford and Wally Shearer serenaded NASA from Gemini 6 in December 1965. Talking of music, mm. do you know the best-selling Christmas single of all time? You being in the biz and all, you must know this. You know your music. You are an expert on music. I don't know. Chris Rear driving home for Christmas? Bing Crosby's Why Christmas. It's older. That makes sense. In the Czech Republic, the traditional Christmas meal is fish soup, eggs and carp. Did you know? They're big on carp there. The number of people at the dinner table must be an even number. Oh, so what do they do if they've got an odd number? Well. Is one of them cold? This takes a turn. Oh. Or the guest without a partner will die the next year. That's not nice. I thought that would be me. <laughs> if, it is, if it is you, just can you let me know in advance because we do schedule these every Wednesday. And finally, I want to tell you about Christmas in Iceland, not the shop. It's a little different in Iceland. They have no Father Christmas. Instead, they have a gang of 13 trolls <laughs> known as the Yule Lads. I shouldn't laugh at tradition. These trolls live in hidden locations in the mountains and descend into town one by one, the first in the early hours of the 12th of December and the last on the 24th. We're the Yule Lads. What are you up to? Then they leave in the same order as they arrived, each spending 13 days with us humans. Traditionally, their actions were a lot darker. After we've had us piss and spray painted. But during the 20th century, the lads became a lot more civilised, gaining the gift-giving reputation of their foreign counterparts. Now we're using chemical toilet. Now Icelandic children leave a shoe on their windowsill, which the lads will fill with gifts. Couldn't you have left us a Mega Drive? they've been naughty... <laughs> Don't want a shoe, again. <laughs> if they'd been naughty, they get a potato. They're 13, as I say. They all come in the same... They arrive in the same order and leave in the same order. And the lads are... The 13 lads are, and I kid you not, the first one is called Stiff Legs, <laughs> and he steals milk. That's his thing. Second, Gully Gawk, who hides in gullies and steals milk. Oh. They clearly like their milk. I love it. Coming third is Stubby. Oh dear. He steals pots and pans and any leftover food. Coming no at num in at number four, Spoon Licker. Oh, in number four, a non-mover. And he will basically have away any unwashed spoons that you leave out, and he will lick them clean. Oh, that's nice. But he won't return them. Oh. Followed by Pot Scraper, who steals any unwashed pots and licks them clean, but won't return them. Number six, Bowl Licker. You might guess what... As a what, theme, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Number seven, he's Door Slammer, and he keeps people awake all night by slamming doors. That'd be really annoying. It's rude. It's really rude. Yeah. Number eight, Skier Gobbler. He steals skier from your cupboards. The yoghurt? The yoghurt. The popular yoghurt in Iceland. It is a traditional part of an Icelandic breakfast. Oh, fair enough. He nabs it. He has it away. He goes and has it. Number nine is my least favourite. Oh. Sausage swiper. He hides in the rafters. When you put your sausages up to be smoked, he will just nab them. Number ten takes a bit of a turn. It's window paper. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. Okay. I mean, he, he, he does what it says in the tin. Right. Essentially. Number 11 is a little bit misleading. He's called Door Sniffer, but what he has a big old nose. Yeah. Big old nose on him, and he can sniff out baking. 
for miles around. Is that and, useful? And he will he will have your cakes. Oh, he eats cakes. He will take your cakes. Number twelve, Meat Hook. Sounds like a horror film. I know. He does sound mm. like a kind of soul villain. This summer, he takes your meat basically off your face. You've got your meat there. Your pie's gone. And then and then this big old hook from nowhere has it away. And finally, Candle Beggar. And he steals children's candles. And I can't imagine they'd be that upset by it. No, you know, you give a kid a candle, I think that they they say, I don't want this, I want a PS Vita. And they are the 13 trolls, and that is the order in which they appear. So they are what you have to put up with, with an Icelandic Christmas. It does take a little bit of a darker turn, because in addition to the lads, is their mother, the ogress Gorilla. And if you've been a particularly nasty child, she will simply stuff you into her sack, take you to her mountain lair, and eat you. On the 25th, you've got through Christmas Eve, you've got your presents, you've had your lovely dinner. It's the evening of Christmas Day. You think you've got through it, but no. That famous expression, beware the Christmas cat. (laughs) Because the Christmas cat is a giant cat who will eat you if you did not receive for Christmas a new item of clothing. Fa la 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 la. Yeah, true facts. Iceland. I'm not going there for Christmas. I wouldn't. All right, Adam. You know what to do. Oh, Merry Christmas. No, the normal one. Why can't we do Merry Christmas? It's Christmas. It's it's timeless. We have not. We've, it's so far, not timeless. We've hardly done enough to mention. I don't think anyone will have noticed this was released at Christmas. Uh, it has not we've been timeless since fairly... the first one. You are the one that makes it not timeless. I mean, having been the man who's literally just done, what, was probably 15 minutes on Christmas, I'm, you know, it's a lofty perch, sir. You mentioned Christmas at the beginning! This is your sign-off. This is your moment to shine, and you're the one saying you don't want to do well, it. you ruined my facts. I didn't ruin the facts. You I... did, you were interrupting. I added to the facts. And we'll see you at the beach. <laughs> More feeling. And we'll see you at the beach. Do you want to say, like, the Christmas beach or something like that? Yeah, no. Christmas, fine.